Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, your audio is working. Uh, we're just waiting for the participants to kind of get into the meeting. We'll be underway in just a few moments. Oh, nice. Seeing uh, some good friends on the uh, attendance list. Hey, Mark, Pam, Ted. Wow, great. Kevin. Some new names. Welcome, everyone. Brian. Ashley, very nice. All right, well, I've got a few minutes after four, uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is David Hiltz. Uh, I am the director for the Citizen CPR Foundation's Heart Safe Community Initiative. Um, good afternoon and welcome to our monthly uh, champions webinar uh, where we uh, have guests on to talk about uh, relative issues, best practices, science, and all things related to uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest. Um, so we've got a terrific guest uh, to share with you today and we'll be introducing him in just a moment. Just wanted to remind everyone of the mission of the Citizen CPR Foundation uh, and our three core values that form the basis uh, for all of our efforts. And knowing that uh, bystander initiated CPR and rapid defibrillation are proven lifesavers, uh, that collaboration among citizens, professionals, communities, and organizations is essential uh, to improving survival from sudden cardiac arrest, and that action based on best practices in science, education, and implementation uh, improves outcomes. I'd also like to take a moment to uh, recognize the foundation's um, uh, supporting members, platinum and gold. Uh, without their generous support, uh, this program and our life-saving efforts uh, would not be possible. Uh, so heartfelt gratitude uh, to each and every member of the foundation's uh, partner council. Um, please, a reminder to everyone, I'm happy to make announcements uh, on your behalf for any significant events that you'd like to promote uh, that are associated with your own uh, organization or geography if you feel that that would be helpful. Uh, please send those along to me or to the foundation in advance of our monthly webinars, and we'd be happy to uh, put in a plug for you. Uh, speaking of plugs, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the fabulous uh, Citizen CPR Foundation uh, Cardiac Arrest Survival Summit, uh, which will commence uh, this December 7th in sunny San Diego. Uh, having been to each and every uh, emergency cardiovascular care update and cardiac arrest survival summit since 1998, I will say that this is a transformative conference and resuscitation. Uh, the content uh, is exceptional as is all of the speakers and truly an unprecedented a networking opportunity. If you can do anything to get there, I would do that, just that, and get there. Uh, next month, um, we're going to change gears a little bit, and uh, we're going to be bringing on some aspiring heart-safe communities, people who are trying to break through the proverbial barriers uh, and you know achieve their life-saving goals. And so I think we can learn a great deal from one another, um, not only from successes, 
uh, but from failures as well or challenges. Uh, so uh, please tune in next month uh, as we join some of our peers uh, to learn about their, their challenges that we can learn from. All right, if the gods of technology will bless us, there we go. Um, please, as a reminder, your microphones are muted. Uh, this way we uh, ensure a quality experience for all of the webinar participants. Um, please capture your questions and comments and feedback using the chat function uh, on the Zoom uh, platform uh, so that we can address them uh, towards the end of the webinar. And so as we ease into today's subject, uh, you know, I'd like to quote uh, Isaac Newton here. And, you know, you all know how to read, including scripts, so I'm not going to uh, read that for you. Uh, but, you know, I'm mindful every day having been doing this kind of stuff uh, for more than a handful of years, that each and every one of us is standing on the shoulders of others, others who are giants, others who were once pioneers, who we have all benefited from their work, their discoveries and their passion. And so to that end, uh, today, we're going to be uh, talking about Dr. Paul Maurice Zoll. And, you know, uh, having hailed from Massachusetts, um, I know a little bit about Dr. Zoll's history. Uh, and, you know, as a, you know, I think I should state this, this is, this program is not about Zoll technology or the Zoll Corporation. It's about the man, the physician, uh, the passionate champion for patients, uh, Dr. Paul Zoll. And, you know, I've got a couple of books at my desk side here uh, that talk about Paul Zoll. But like many giants, I think we often forget some of the fabulous discoveries that they've made and how that's affected all of our lives, countless lives. And so I, I have the fantastic pleasure of having my great friend, uh, Dr. Stafford Cohen, uh, who's a retired cardiologist from uh, the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston, uh, Massachusetts, uh, to talk about today about Paul Zoll, you know, a pioneering champion and advocate uh, for patients. And Stafford and I met uh, at uh, a Heart Rhythm Society meeting probably 15 or 20 years ago now, I guess. And I heard him talk about uh, Dr. Zoll and I thought this was just an absolutely fantastic story. So I'm very happy uh, to be sharing um, uh, Stafford with you all uh, today. So I'm gonna see if I can uh, drop my... Um, my slide share and go to this view. And uh, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Stafford Cohen. Stafford, thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, you look great and it's so awesome to see your face. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, Stafford? Yes, I can. And thank you for, that, uh, for inviting me, David, uh, to uh, join you today. Let me tell you a little about my relationship with Paul Zoll, and that will tell you about me. All right. Uh, yeah, I uh, graduated uh, uh, from medical school in Boston, and uh, during my medical school uh, period between 1957 and 1961, I was introduced to Paul Zoll uh, by initially going to one of his lectures at Boston City Hospital. And by that time, he had already developed uh, the external pacer. He had developed his heart rhythm monitor. The first was in 1952, the second in 1953. He had developed the external defibrillator in 1956. Gee, these sound like ancient things, but indeed uh, they're in my lifetime and yours. 
Uh, and then in 1960, he had uh, implanted the first long-term self-contained pacemaker, meaning the battery didn't have to be charged in any way through an external means. So I graduated in 1961 and was fortunate enough to get an internship at Beth Israel Hospital at that time, which was Paul's hospital. Mm -hmm. And it was a magnet for people having life-threatening arrhythmias, people having heart block and needing permanent pacemakers. And I was there in postgraduate work for four years. And during that time, I got to know Paul as a mentor and eventually as a friend. Now, over time, I became a member, a staff member at the hospital. And I worked with him and eventually I shared an office with him. And in his later years, it dawned on me that he had never kept a journal, never kept a diary, never wrote an, an autobiography. No one ever wrote a biography about him. And I was quite familiar with the several, less than a handful of close colleagues that he worked with. And I decided at some point that I would write a biography and that I was positioned to do it better than anyone else. So over a five year period, I did interviews. I read everything I possibly could that was ever written about him. Uh, I looked at interviews that had been done with him. And I hope I can tell you today a little bit about Paul the man and why he succeeded when others failed. So that's my introduction. Uh, oh, I had, so excellent. I think I've told you a little about myself uh, and maybe as we go on, you'll learn a little bit more about me. Yeah, delightful. And, you know, so, hey, everyone, I'll tell you that not only is Stafford an incredible writer and author, he's exceptionally well published, but he is a storyteller beyond storytellers. He is a storyteller's storyteller. And, you know, I recall vividly uh, some of our past discussions about uh, various um, Paul Zoll anecdotes, you know, about various things about tennis courts and phones that stretched only one side of the court and a junket that he took to Pennsylvania to pick up a patient with heart block and bringing him back and, and just all of these incredibly wonderful stories. So Stafford, you know, you've just got all of this incredible stuff up in your head. I'm just going to say, roll with it and share a story with us that tells us what, how Paul was such a great champion and, and something that reflects on his commitment to patients. I think uh, there are many, there really are many, uh, but I think one of the better ones is uh, one of his favorite patients, a woman named Jean, Jeannie Rogers, Jeannie Rogers, or Jean Rogers. He was well known for managing patients with heart block. Gene Rogers was born, uh, or very early on, uh, had complete heart block. And youngsters do fairly well with complete heart block in many instances if their pacemaker is at the atrioventricular node rather than the sinus node. Uh, she had had a fainting spell or two uh, in, in high school and in grammar school, but she was getting along well. Uh, she fell in love uh, with a wonderful guy and she was advised not to have children. And lo and behold, she was being looked after by Dr. Natus at the Children's Hospital in Boston. And she tells him against advice that she's pregnant. Well, Natus knew of Paul Zoll's 
special interest and referred her to Paul. And Paul and the obstetrician got her through the pregnancy and through the delivery. Uh, and after delivery, uh, she had a slowing of her pacemaker. She had more problems and she was told she required a pacemaker. And she was among the first to get a pacemaker. The first one was in 1960 and hers was about two years later or three years later. And she was delighted to have it because now with it, she could have more children and she wanted to have a bigger family. Uh, so uh, pacemakers in those days were not easy. There were all sorts of problems with lead breakage, infection, uh, uh, and uh, disruptions of the pacemaker per se. And she went through several operations, but she was the first woman in the world to have, give birth to a child, a baby with a pacemaker. First woman with a pacemaker to give birth to a baby. And she got all sorts of calls and inquiries about being put into the Guinness Book of Records and Paul said, I don't advise you. You'll be haunted for your whole life about this. She didn't want the publicity, but indeed she was the first patient. Eventually, Paul went on to develop a, a wonderful reputation uh, and eventually got the Albert Lasker Award for his clinical research uh, investigation and helping patients. Uh, the important thing is, half his whole academic life, he did research half time and patient care the other half. He knew what patients needed. He didn't go from the lab to the uh, bedside. He went from the bedside to the lab and developed what was needed to help people at the bedside. Everything he did was for the benefit of patients. And that's where we get back to Jeannie Rogers. When he was presented with the Lasker Award at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, he brought Jeannie Rogers as an example of what his electrocardiac therapy could achieve. He had her there right on stage with him when he received the Lasker Award. As a matter of fact, she carried it back to Boston on the airplane. And he and his family had become over time very friendly with she and her family. Her husband was a firefighter and also a mechanic. And whenever Paul had a problem with his car, <laughs> Jeannie's husband came racing over to fix it. So the two families were very close uh, and she's a perfect example of his commitment to patient care. He worked 24 hours a day, 24 seven, he was available to patients. Whenever she had a problem, she came over immediately. And that's, I think, one of the stories, just one of many, that exemplifies his commitment to patients. Incredible. And thank you. I haven't been told that one by you before. I, I think I've read a little bit about it, but I haven't heard you share that with me in the past. You know, Stafford, it's a conversation and a story that you've shared with me previously but it's got to be among my favorites, probably because of my, you know, my own past and the ambulance service and so forth. But that trip that he took out to Pennsylvania, would, would you indulge us on that one and include the diner story, please? Oh, okay. That's the best part of the story. It is. Well, I think the point was that uh, Paul had a reputation and his hospital uh, 
was a magnet actually for many people in this country and internationally uh, to come for care, especially for issues regarding uh, implantation of pacemakers. And uh, he got word that the, uh, from a family in Pennsylvania that uh, clearly, and the doctor looking after the patient of a gentleman who was in clear need of a pacemaker. The man had fainted a number of times, had had complete heart block and needed a permanent pacemaker. And uh, when it came time to transferring that patient, the local doctors looking after the patient didn't want the responsibility of transferring uh, the patient uh, who was, they said, too unstable to be transferred uh, and was on a nice and all drip. The ambulance company was not familiar with managing someone like that, what if he had a cardiac arrest and asystole in, in, in transit? They weren't sure how to handle that. Uh, Paul got word of this and uh, he said, well, uh, if the ambulance companies won't take him and uh, the man clearly needs a pacemaker or a long-term pacemaker, I'll go down there and I'll take him back. I'll transport him. So Paul went down to Pennsylvania. I think it was Altoona or is there such a place, Altoona, Pennsylvania. I have it written down in the, in the biography uh, and uh, picked him up, got permission. Man signed out against advice, but got permission uh, from the, the doctors. If that's the way he wants it and you want it, fine. So the man had an intravenous with an isoprel drip in a, you know, uh, infusion. Uh, Paul had the man in the car. Paul and the man drove back to Boston, but midway, uh, they had picked him up quite early. Uh, it was time for lunch. <laughs> so Paul drives into a, a fast food place, wheels the <laughs> IV stand, uh, and goes in, sits in a booth, and uh, they order, the waitress takes the, the order and, uh, and she's coming back with a tray of, of food. And for the first time she sees the intravenous running <laughs> and she gets so panicked, she drops the tray on Paul <laughs> and all the food goes running down the, you know, his, uh, his clothing, uh, his uh, lap, his pants get soiled. Uh, she goes back and reorders they eat. Paul, without incident, gets back to Boston. The man does have his uh, permanent pacemaker place and does well after that. But the joke is when Paul enters the hospital, he's totally soiled with food. Uh, but that's again, his commitment to a patient. He, he, you have to have wisdom you have to have courage, you have to have vision. And those are the three things that really Paul had, among other things, that in these races to be the first in the world, and he was the first in the world to do four things, external pacing, heart rhythm monitoring, alarmed so people would know when there's a problem, external defibrillation. And he was actually the second in the world to implant a long-term pacer in an adult, but the first in the world to implant a long-term pacer in a child. So those are four world firsts within 10 years, extraordinary. Absolutely. He did other things, but those are the four big things and probably the biggest, the biggest, most important is the external defibrillator because these uh, defibrillators that are the descendants of what he did are still external defibrillators. 
Whereas the first external defibrillator he did, he then had an internal defibrillator when they could miniaturize things. Uh, the first external pacer internalized. And of course, the first external uh, alarm monitor, you know, we have all sorts of algorithms now that are in the internal defibrillators and pacemakers. And even uh, you can have an implantable uh, uh, rhythm detector per se. All those things have been miniaturized and internalized. And Paul had that vision but the external defibrillator, automated external defibrillator in every airport, in every sports stadium, in most health clubs, in most schools, uh, that's all extraordinary. That's all Absolutely, time. absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, you bring a couple of things to light and, you know, regarding the Paul's wisdom and courage, and I think, you know, in terms of our other, you know, emerging and established champions and pioneers and that, you know, if I were to select a word, uh, you know, I would probably gravitate towards something like dauntless, uh, you know, fearless uh, courage. Um, you know, I'm certain that you know, Paul's ideas were like many pioneers, uh, were not always embraced uh, up front by, by his peers. Um, you know, the circling back to the patient, uh, Jenny, uh, you know, I mean, there's a story behind the pacemaker leads, right? When he met with uh, some engineer who wasn't really this stuff and wanted to know how many times the lead would be bent. And, you know, Paul was like, oh, a million times a day or something like that. This is going to give, you know, a lead into another anecdote uh, for us, Stafford. Um, but, you know, the patient keeps circling back to the biggest thing and, and Paul's, you know, world of importance. The patient, the patient, the patient. Everything began with the patient. Everything ended with the patient. Um, and, you know, somewhere in between here, uh, you know, we managed to chair uh, the first, if I'm not mistaken, the first American Heart Association Emergency Cardiovascular Care Committee um, in Massachusetts. Um, I mean, just extraordinary, all of his uh, efforts and, you know, his wanting to be, we take so much for granted today uh, you know, about being connected with smartphones and things of that nature. But Paul went to extreme measures just to be accessible to his patients should the need arise. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Stafford, with gratitude. The question comes up even today, as it did in the past. Uh, why did doctors go into medicine? Uh, Paul, initially, you know, he, he was quite brilliant, actually. Uh, he was always uh, with many, many honors. Uh, he, he went to Harvard College, Harvard Medical School. Uh, initially, he was quite shy. Uh, he initially started out in research, uh, coronary artery research. He was a Macy Fellow. And then the war came along and he was quite fortunate, I think, to uh, initially be assigned uh, 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 to uh, one of the islands uh, uh, in the Aleutians, uh, but then he got quite ill uh, for, with pneumonia there, uh, hosh hosh winters and was transferred to the European front. And then uh, just before D-Day, Dwight Harkin, uh, a classmate of Paul's at Harvard Medical School uh, was assigned to be the head of a specialty thoracic surgeon, surgery hospital, uh, anticipating there would be many uh, soldiers with chest injuries 
airlifted from Europe, uh, Germany, or France uh, to Great Britain, back to uh, just about a, a, a hundred miles northwest of London, was where this hospital was, and. Parkin knew that Zoll was uh, somewhere in Europe and requisitioned him to come to be the chief of medicine at that hospital. Well, uh, Harkin operated uh, open chest surgery on uh, soldiers that had uh, uh, bullets within their heart or shrapnel around the heart and great vessels. And lo and behold, at least 53 soldiers operated on by Harkin with Paul's all at the, at the side of Harkin observing and managing all any preoperative, intraoperative or postoperative arrhythmias. He recognizes that the heart is super sensitive to any stimulus, touch it, with an instrument, touch it with your finger, barely breathe on the heart that's exposed and it has contractile sensitivity. Now being a patient advocate, once again, when he gets back to Boston and when Harkin gets back to the Peter Bent Brigham in the Longwood Medical Area or a stone throw from Paul's hospital, Paul now is no longer a research associate. He's now a staff member full-time staff, has to teach, has to do research, and he goes back to his original research and has to take care of patients. He has a young woman, less than 60, who comes in with heart block. The only treatment in those days was heart accelerating medications like isoproteranol. He gives her what pharmacological treatment her episodes get more frequent. It stokes Adam's attack. People would faint and then recover consciousness, but the episodes get more prolonged. The heart rate slows and she dies. He is grief stricken with that. He's in charge of this young woman and the autopsy reveals a perfectly normal heart. All other organs are normal. The only prob problem the heart isn't perfectly normal in all respects. The conduction system is troubled. Paul gets the bright idea and out of his memory emerges what happened in the service. A heart is super sensitive. In those days, if a heart arrested, it was opened and massaged and medications were administered intracardiac. Paul wonders if it's so sensitive, is it possible an electrical charge and an electrical stimulus from the surface of the heart can penetrate deep within the chest and stimulate the heart per se? That's his grand idea. And he immediately shifts, shifts from doing coronary pathological correlations to trying to work on life-threatening heart arrhythmias and complete heart block. And you're quite right, David. When he starts out, he's on his own. Herman Blumgott, his chief, gives him a lab space and someone named A. Stone Friedberg, Dr. Friedberg, who's on the Mass Heart Committee, gets a grant for Paul, a huge grant. $5,000, enormous grant. Paul needs it, uses it, succeeds. And his commitment to that patient, and it's as if, it's as if he said to himself, I am going to prevent other patients like this from dying. I'm gonna find a way that can be applied immediately externally to save them. And he does that. And he realizes when he has his first patient that he saves after 53 hours of pacing, 
a save, frankly, in those days was having somebody discharged from the hospital. That was a great success. He realized at that moment that patient was still in jeopardy. He realized and started at that moment, I need something more reliable. This patient's gonna have repetition, another episode. That's the way it has to be, it usually is. We'll get something more stable. We'll get a permanent pacemaker. In those days, it was continuous pacing. If the heart sinus rhythm were to stop, the pacemaker would take over. Commitment to patients throughout his entire life. And I'll add one more, one more brief comment, uh, anecdote. When he was ready to retire from patient care, he had done enough, everybody thought. He had done a hell of a lot. And he was asked by a cousin, uh, do you have any regrets? He said, yes, I should have done more. Yeah. Should have done more. He had four world firsts in treatment. When I asked him, I didn't ask him. I said, Paul, you know, uh, don't be despondent. Uh, you can still work in your laboratory. You've done so much in the lab. You can continue your research in your lab. And he said, no, without patients, there's no reason to be in the lab. I don't have an incentive to be in the lab. The patients were everything. So uh, that was sad to hear, but also uh, looking back on his life, it was uh, wonderful. Oh. All uh, tell me. Wonderful achievements. Yeah, why all did he, Yeah, why did he have so many achievements? I, you know, it's not, it was his character. He was stubborn. You mentioned it yourself. Uh, he had a lot of resistance and opposition. He said, I'm stubborn. <laughs> I don't care what people say. I have confidence in my ideas. And no matter what they say, I'm going to pursue them. And he had plenty of opposition uh, on many accounts. And he just let it run off his back like a duck has water roll off his back. He just persisted. And he had collaboration. You know, right now we're all told to collaborate. He had collaborators. He was a leader among them. He led with them, not in front of them. He had three people of four. He had an engineer, and you mentioned <laughs> a short story. He went to, with his major idea about external pacing, he, he went to uh, one company and they told him, uh, oh no, this is a crazy idea. We're not gonna do this. And even if it's a success, we, we're so busy uh, we don't have time for it, and our taxes would go up, you know, if it really works. But Alan Belgard, an engineer, uh, had confidence in him. Uh, he had Arthur Lindenthal, uh, electrophysiologist. Uh, he had a surgeon, uh, uh, Norman uh, Zarsky, Nor Norma Zarsky, who, uh, uh, who, uh, ran his uh, animal lab, his experimental lab. And he had Howard Frank, uh, a committed uh, thoracic surgeon uh, do his internal pacemakers. Uh, so uh, I, I, I misstated that. It's Leona Norman Zasky, the person who, a, a superb surgeon. Uh, and during the war, when all the men were away, uh, in the, in the service, uh, she was doing major surgery in their place. <laughs> you know, as a woman, she wasn't need, uh, needed in the army. She was left on the home front. Anyway, he collaborated with these people. Uh, he had the idea, he simply threw out the idea. They were all extraordinarily capable people. They picked up the ball and developed the uh, methods to complete the idea. 
So yeah. collaboration's important. Uh, having confidence in your own ideas, uh, having vision, uh, all those things are important and they can be very useful today. And first and foremost, be an absolute advocate for your patients. Uh -huh. Very difficult today, extremely difficult uh -huh. because you have to be an advocate for your hospital, for the insurance company, you know, uh, there are many advocacies that are required for the guidelines. You have to be careful that you work within the guidelines, uh, but do your best to be an advocate for the patients. <laughs> he wow. did his best. You know, a, a number of just incredibly reaffirming statements in there. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a very simple person. Those of you on the call know this to be absolutely true. You know, I recall once early in my career, uh, you know, being told if you always put the patient's needs as number one, everything else will fall into place. And so as incredibly simplistic that advice may have been, it certainly paid out dividends, at least for me, over a long period of time. Now, we've got a little more time, Stafford, and and I'm still intrigued with like all of these like seemingly, you know, these little short stories about Paul and a lot of them kind of bring a smile to my face and, and really illustrates like Paul Zoll, like behind the curtain kind of thing. So. Tell me a little bit about Paul's, because we're talking Paul Dudley White era. I mean, we're talking, we're talking about a lot of stuff here. Tell me about Paul's commitment to physical fitness, and then somehow you got to work in the tennis court and the phone. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, that's important, and not to physical fitness necessarily, uh, but we're all taught nowadays or advised nowadays in order to avoid burnout and it certainly happens in first responders in nurses and doctors make some time for yourself get away from the day-to-day -day grueling uh, tense aspects of your work well paul Paul slept little. Uh, he was on call 24-7. Uh, I actually was a neighbor of his, and I witnessed all of this firsthand. He was a very good athlete. He was a short fellow. And I'm told that in college, he played basketball and could sink a ball from half court. I don't know if that's true or not, but his son told me that. Uh, he never mentioned much about basketball, but he, he had a recreational backyard. He had a swimming pool, a tennis court, and he had an outboard motorboat on a trailer, and he could trail it nearby to Lake Kachichuit and water ski. So he was a recreational athlete. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of stories. I'll tell the one you uh, have heard. Uh, he uh, was an excellent tennis player. And I'm a mediocre tennis player. And I would live nearby. And he would give me a call every so often and said, uh, do you want some exercise? <laughs> exercise. Well, he was a much better player than I was. But we would play uh we would rally and, you know, back and forth for the exercise. Uh, but I always noticed he generally called later in the day and the sun would be past noon and on, on the way drifting down. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, on one portion of the court, the sun was at your back and at the other portion, it was in your eyes. <laughs> and Paul, we didn't have beepers in those days. Uh, uh, cell phones, of course, were out. 
uh, but he had a long line phone and a huge line that went from his house to a little table on the edge of the tennis court uh, nearest his home. And that happened to be the portion of the court that the sun was at your back and I would be on the other side with the sun in my eyes. And uh, yeah, there was a bit of an advantage to having the sun at your back. But, you know, we would have a lot of fun, get some exercise. And at the end, and he always wore a, an old, uh, ragged uh, uh, shorts that were swim shorts and an old ragged, uh, you know, T-shirt. And at the end of the uh, time that we were had played, he would take off this T-shirt. And now I know why he had an old pair of swim trunks. He would jump into the swimming pool to cool off. <laughs> so that's that's that story. Uh, there's another one though that uh, it's a bit sad in a way, but uh, uh, he was very cautious. Uh, I was told that uh, when he uh, was early on uh, in his marriage and he got married uh, uh, before the war, actually, uh, he had met uh, his wife uh, while training. He had one year of training at Bellevue. Uh, he had met her and when he got back to Boston, uh, uh, again, doing research with coronary uh, anatomy, and correlating it to clinical courses, uh, they got married. Uh, and uh, in summertime, they used to, uh, she was a nurse, uh, he was a doctor, they would go to a summer camp for a week or two or whatever, but there was a drowning at that camp, some child drowned. And when he got his swimming pool built and his children born, he insisted that they go to Crystal Lake, which was a nearby lake and take swimming lessons. So they would know how to swim well. And when he got his uh, outboard motorboat and started to go water skiing, his kids insisted that he take advanced swimming lessons because he now would be in charge of the boat and other people who were being, uh, you know, uh, ski, water skiing. Uh, so they were very, very cautious about safety, safety. And no, last week you had a whole session on drowning and be prepared in advance, go through your drills. Uh, he did all of that. And he was again, as I said earlier, an excellent skier water skier. He could ski on one ski, I've, I've been told, and do it very well. So that's uh, the lesson. The lesson was uh, to uh, have some pursuit of something that occupies your mind uh, that's away from your day-to-day -day stresses at work. That's a healthy thing to do. And Paul's advice to everyone on the call would be do just that. Make sure you do something. Uh, and by the way, I mean, he never could play golf. I mean, tennis was the perfect thing and swimming. You could put that into your schedule anytime you had the time, you know, and quit any time that was necessary, you know. Golf would be something he would never do. Uh, because that would interrupt his connection, his financial right, yeah, connection yeah. with patients. You can't be off call, you know, uh, uh, really for golf. You can't just drop your golf game and go running. Well, this is um, this has been beyond uh, all of my expectations, uh, Stafford, and you know, uh, regretfully. Um, there's only so many hours in the in the day, but I am I am so glad uh, that we were able to reconnect and we were able to share you and uh, Paul's story uh, with our advocate champions on the phone. 
Um, you know, it's easy to get disappointed, even if we're carrying some of that dauntless attitude uh, that, that Paul Zoll had. Uh, sometimes we can feel defeated. We can feel as though we haven't done enough. Uh, and so it's stories of pioneers uh, like Paul Zoll and yourself uh, that provides inspiration uh, and guidance and reminds us of our, uh, our commitment to patience, uh, the power of collaboration, and the importance of being dauntless. It's my seems to be my uh, favorite word of the day. But that fearless uh, courage is kind of necessary. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring the slides back up, Stafford, to close out the meeting. Uh, but on behalf of the Citizen CPR Foundation, uh, their board of directors, our sponsors, and very importantly, myself, um, I just wanted to say uh, how thankful I am for uh, your willingness to share with us uh, today. So let me... Uh, Bring the slides back up here. There's uh, your handsome self and just a few wrap up items here, folks. So, hey, this is uh, a human tower uh, being built in Spain. If you've ever seen one of these things, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And I, I recall with uh, you know distinct vividness, uh, Mary Franizinski talking about this when she received her Hans Dahl uh, recognition at the Cardiac Arrest Survival Summit in Seattle in 2019. And I wanted to associate this message of building on each other's shoulders and how big we can get and how high we can go with the Citizen CPR Foundation's 40 under 40 uh, recognition program. So uh, many of you uh, participate in these webinars routinely. You know that within a few days, you're going to get um, a message uh, from us, follow up. Within this message, there's going to be an opportunity uh, to nominate a peer or yourself for 40 under 40 recognition. And with the idea being that we're building, you know, a, a succession plan of, of people like you all and people like Stafford and, and Paul Zoll and Mary Franizinski and all these other people, you know, Claude Beck, Frank Pantridge, uh, you know, Peter Moyer, the list goes on and on. So this is a very important thing to consider. Uh, so when you get that message, uh, don't just read it, uh, but act on it, okay? Uh, and then please, within the chat function, uh, provide us with your feedback and ideas uh, for um, today's uh, webcast as well as uh, future ones. And then I'm going to go ahead and stop the share here uh, and see if there are, because we have just a few minutes, we can see if there are any uh questions that we might be able to entertain. Mallory, could you help us out? Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, we have someone asking if there's going to be time for Heart Safe Community Initiatives. Um, so Mary, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you have a specific question you'd like to ask. Go ahead, Mary. I see, that your, I see She's that your microphone is muted. Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, okay. we can. Sorry there. about that. So I'm uh, on the call with a few faculty members from Malloy College, and we're interested in starting the Heart Safe Community Initiative this fall. Um, we've created quite a good team, but we keep coming upon this term community and wanted to know a little bit more about how it, do we define community? Is it by uh, zip code or populace? Yeah, so currently the Citizen CPR Foundation defines community as a municipal entity 
or census designated area. Uh, but with that said, Mary, uh, when you get your uh, follow-up mail message from us, I would encourage you to reach out to me directly uh, because regardless of what type of recognition is at the end of this story, uh, we're all moving in the same direction and that is improving outcomes in every community, however we define community. Uh, so I'm eager to work with you and your group and uh, eager to learn more about your campaign. Fair enough? Very good, thank you. Oh no, thank you, Mary. What else do we have, Mallory? That is all I'm seeing right now. Um, we've seen great support and enthusiasm on the topic, um, but no, no questions. Oh, we just got one actually. Oh, Can that's a comment? good one. Okay, go ahead with that, David. Yeah, so um, this is great, Stafford. So uh, Dr. Ofterheide is in the audience and he'd like for us to comment on Paul's interest in cardiac arrest resuscitation versus cardiology uh, pacing, also development of his company and how that integrated into his life. We can run over here, Stafford. It's, it's fine because I think this is an interesting part of Paul's story and that there was some separation there, but please go ahead. And thank you, Dr. Afteridi. Thank you for the question. Uh, Paul uh, was on the resuscitation committee of the Beth Israel Hospital, as well as uh, a leader uh, of the resuscitation committee uh, for a period of time for the Mass Heart Association. Uh, he had a, an, a established an algorithm uh, of several, depending upon the situation if somebody collapsed uh, to determine uh, how to revive them. Uh, as you know, the external pacer uh, did work in, in, in a hearts that uh, did, were not severely damaged with a myocardial infarction. Uh, for the most part in early days, uh, they worked with Stokes-Adams attacks, which was basically often a good heart that had problems with the conduction system. Uh, he, he gradually realized that if someone had had massive heart damage or a lot of heart damage, uh, external pacing would not work. Uh, but I recall, I recall uh, a conflict at the hospital where he actually turned out to be correct the head of the resuscitation committee at the hospital was an anesthetist, John Headley White, a well-known an an anesthetist who believed that the first thing to do when somebody had a, a, an arrest was to intubate them. Paul said, don't waste your time intubating. It, sometimes it's difficult and it does take time. Start cardiac compression. Initially, it was simply for asystole, it was e or via ventricular fibrillation. It was the quickest thing was isoproteranol initially, then external pacing or defibrillation. Uh, but then uh, Kuenhoven through Hopkins developed CPR. And Paul said, the first thing to do if someone is arrested and pulseless is CPR, don't intubate. He had this huge, huge conflict with Paul Dudley White. Uh, he was right. Paul Dudley White was the head and insisted on intubation against Paul's wishes. And then the issue about uh, pacing. Well, now I think we know and have learned that uh, the fastest uh, or the most reliable thing is to quickly put in a temporary pacer. However, external pacing is still a possibility. So I hope I've answered the question. I don't know if I have as thoroughly as the questionnaire wished. But yeah, I so I hope Valerie. That why don't we, why don't we uh, see to unmuting Dr. Eifter Heidi's microphone 
Uh, the so issue of the, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. L let me add one thing. I think the question was, uh, how, how did Paul Zoll, the company, uh, establish the, the Zoll uh, Medical? Yeah, uh, well, Paul uh, had developed uh, in the 1980s a painless external pacer. The initial one, of course, was painful. Uh, it was high voltage, battery operated after that. It was wall circuitry. It was small uh, discs applied to the chest. Um, and uh, it was painful. Paul said, being painful is worth it if you can save a life. If it's painful, give morphine or something like morphine, even anesthetize the person if you have to put them under totally until you can work out the means for them to stabilize or if they need a permanent pacer. It's worth the pain. Let them tolerate the pain. Actually, the first patient that ever got external pacing deluded Paul into thinking it could be painless. That first patient could speak, could eat, all that was seen was some muscle twitching. The patient seemed fine, but subsequent patients had pain. And some, it was intolerable, intolerable. So in the 1980s, Paul Sun, who was a, a physicist, had a doctorate in, in physics, uh, told Paul and Alan Belgott, they had uh, an idea, could we establish or develop a painless pacemaker? And they did it by constant current. Instead of having this concentrating the voltage into a small area, they used big pads uh, and they increased the pulse width of the pacing, which made it less pain you know, less uh, uncomfortable. So the three of those things had either painless or minimal pain or tolerable pain. Well, Paul had a patient, a doctor who he was looking after and the son who was an entrepreneur accompanied the father and Paul mentioned he had a new idea and this entrepreneur convinced Paul to start a company. And they did. They did with $100,000 raised by the entrepreneur's friends. Uh, and that entrepreneur likes to think and states, whoever started a huge company with only $100,000? So eventually it went through some uh, different itinerations and it ended up as all medical. And Zoll Medical Paul was the head uh, uh, of research and loved the job there. Uh, and the company uh, embodies his legacy, which was don't put anything in the market and Paul wouldn't publish anything about his instruments unless it was safe. First, be certain it's safe. Second, be certain it's effective. And that is the philosophy that the company persists in having following Paul Zoll's lead. So I hope that further answers the question and maybe more comprehensively. Excellent, Stafford, thank you. And Mallory, why don't we have Tom on mute and uh, perhaps he'd like to make a few remarks as we close out the meeting. Tom? He's muted. Tom, if you want to just unmute yourself. Oh, there he is. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, OK. Uh, so I was just uh, just wanted to comment uh, how fabulous this is to have uh, such a wonderful insight into the person uh, that has uh, established uh, technology that has just helped so many people. So thank you so much. Uh, it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful insight. If I can add just one more comment. Go ahead, Paul Stafford. Zoll would say, tell everybody who's listening, 
be be the best that you can have high standards be the best you can be more than competent so that would be paul's last message to everyone listening uh, stafford that was just spot on thank you so much everyone on behalf of citizen cpr foundation uh, our guest, Dr. Stafford Cohen, myself, our fabulous host, Mallory. Uh, I hope you have a terrific remainder of your day. Uh, thank you for all that you do, and we hope to see you next month. Ciao.